Hi, welcome back to the Dowie Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Kenneth Fish. Dr. Fish's name is a familiar one to those in the know in the martial arts community in general and the internal martial arts community in particular. He has an interesting history as a student of the arts and is well-respected as a teacher as well. And today we hope to talk to him about his uh, history and present future uh, in martial arts. Dr. Fish, thanks for taking out some time to talk to me this afternoon. Well, thank you. Um... To start, I'd like to parenthetically say that um, we were introduced by uh, Yang Hai, yes. Master Yang Hai, and uh, he said, oh, yes, a friend of mine wants to speak to some of the old masters. And so that leaves me out. <laughs> and he said, no, you're at the age now where you're an old master. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're as depressing. I said in the introduction, you're, you're very well known. It's it's hard to find information about you when I but when I speak to people like Master Young, you know, he speaks very highly of you. And a lot of the uh, teachers who have been around for a while and are respected speak very highly of you. So I'm uh, very interested to get to know more about you. Can you well, can you tell you. us how you got started uh, in the martial arts to begin with? Yeah, I got the crap beaten out of me. Uh, yeah, that's a common story. Yeah, well, it was uh, an uncommon instance. I was. Uh, waiting in line to uh, go to a court hearing and uh -huh. the person behind me was um, actually the person who I was uh, taking to court and they flipped out and beat the shit out of me in the, wow. in the court. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was, um, you know, a, a clarion call to me to learn how to do something. I was very young. I was um, 13. Oh, this happened. And uh, I was very fortunate. A friend of mine, uh, I, I had friends in the Chinese community. I, I'd been uh, in and out of Chinatown a lot in New York City. And uh, I was working as an ice cream scoop at a Baskin Robbins. And um, the girl who was working with me, her brother was uh, a member of a kind of gang. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'd really like to learn martial arts. And um, I said, should I go to, and I'm not going to mention the name, a well-known Tai Chi teacher's school. And she said, so oh, that's for the Patty boys. Um, and uh, she said, uh, go learn something like Hungar or something where they really teach you how to fight. And I got lucky. A friend of mine introduced me to Henry Leung, who whose family system is Wing Chun. And it's really this, um, he's a cousin of Liang Zhang. Yeah. And learned from Liang Bik, uh, as well as learning um, from uh, Yang Gaofu, uh, who was one of Bruce Lee's teachers. Right. Uh, Yang, Yang, Gaofu, Yang Gaofu was um, very, very good at Southern Praying Mantis and Red Boat Wing Chun. So Henry's Wing Chun started off unusual to begin with. Henry learned from his uncle, who was the prelate of the um, Liang family um, ancestral temple in Futsan, and taught a, a very unusual form of Wing Chun. And uh, then Henry further refined it with his teacher here in the States when he came to the States. Um, and I was Henry's first inner door student, and which at the time meant nothing to me. I mean, I was not a starry eyed, Bruce Lee influenced, um, you know, aficionado of the martial arts. I was, I wanted to learn how to beat the crap out of people. Right. Um, and uh, Henry taught me very, very slowly, one move at a time. And he had several open students. All of the teaching went on in Henry's restaurant. On um, oh, what was the street? Um, it was Bowery, and uh, <clears throat> I forget the name of the street. It's the street where the uh, um, Williamsburg Bridge is. Okay. Um, so Henry taught me in the basement there, and he had other people learning from him. And I would say, "Gee, they seem to be learning something different than I am." He said, "Don't worry about it." And uh, so I learned Wing Chun very, very well for about a year and a half. Um, and then I moved to Taiwan. I was adopted by 
two different families. I was adopted by a French family living in New York when I was nine mm -hmm. and then adopted by a Chinese family when I was 14 and ended up moving to Taiwan. And in Taiwan, um, I continued practicing what I'd learned and sought out other teachers. Now, what I did not know at the time was that my adopted father, who was very high in the um, nationalist intelligence, uh, army intelligence, in fact, he reported directly to Chiang Kai-shek, I did not know that he was a very well-respected and very highly skilled martial artist in his own right. I didn't find this out until way later. So every time I would wander around looking for a Kung Fu teacher, um, what I didn't know was, first of all, that my movements were very well uh, reported to my father, because Taiwan is a city of gossips. And uh, for example, I met a teacher who taught a version of Dragon Style, really good teacher, but all he taught were the um, uh, triads, the, uh, the criminal organizations. Right. <clears throat> I was with him for about three weeks, and then he said, nope, this isn't for you. I was like, really? I'm, I'm enjoying this. He said, no, no, no. And th this happened a few times, and I finally stumbled into another teacher's studio uh, who became my long-term teacher. That was Zhang Qingfeng. And he originally was not interested in teaching me. And I sat down, and he said, well, what have you studied before? And he said, oh, I'm Zhang. And in Taiwan in those days, if you said one time, they were like, never heard of it. What is that? Um, cause it was, it was a small Cantonese system. It didn't become a big deal until much later. Um, and on the way, as he was directing me out of his studio, very politely, I looked up on the wall and I saw a little, um, deity box where, you know, where they, would, uh, light incense and make offerings. And I said, Oh, you're a Mizong Buddhist. And he stopped in his tracks and said, what? He said, you're a Mizum Buddhist, so am I. And he said, really? And he said, yeah. And he said, okay, come tomorrow at 5.30 in the morning. Um, so I showed up at 5.30 in the morning. Oh, I found out later that he and I, we had different definitions of Mizum. He was actually Iguan Dao. In fact, he was one of the leaders of the Iguan Dao in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I had studied Tibetan Buddhism with uh, the emissary of the Dalai Lama. So, wow. which is a completely different form of mead zone. But the, the little altar that he had had all of the mead zone characteristics to it. So I stayed with Master Zhang until he passed away, and then I continued studying with his wife, who really was the person who had been teaching for the previous 15 years anyway, um, and uh, learned Xingyi and Bagua from him, and peripherally learned a lot of other stuff while I was there. And it bears telling that in Taiwan and Hong Kong at the time, and probably the rest of Southeast Asia, there was no mystical um, content to Chinese martial arts, excepting among the really kind of like mm, not very legitimate borderline type teachers. It was it had the same mystical content as baseball. Right. So, you know, you learned... What were you learning? You were learning something very physical. It required a lot of physical work. And it was great. I enjoyed it. So that that was my background in, in Chinese martial arts. And the only other teacher whom I've met who I thought was worth, really worth studying for was Master Yan, um, who is, again, it's his family system of Xingyi and Bagua that has a very um, broad and very deep basis to it. Now, um, Zhang Chunfeng uh, originally was from Tianjin, correct? The same city as correct. Master Yang is from. Well, actually, actually, he was from Shandong. He was from um, Yantai. Oh. Um, but he lived in uh, Tianjin and had a business there. A, uh, he was a wholesaler of rice and vegetables. Um, and he learned he learned from Gao Yisheng in Tianjin, as well as from other teachers. Um, I believe he probably learned from um, Zhou Yuxiang, who was one of Gao Yisheng's teachers. Um, and he definitely had contact with Zhang Zhao Deng because they were all part of the Yiguan Dao. And in fact, um, 
and this is something I've said before, and I'll, you'll probably hate know about this. Um, uh, Wang Shujin was a Iguan Dao student, but he wasn't a martial artist until he got to Taiwan. And it was because of my teacher, Zhang Jinfeng and Chen Pangli, that he became known as a martial artist because they taught him because being Iguan Dao in Taiwan at the time was illegal. Oh, right, yeah. Prescribed a sect. Right. Yeah. Right. For quite some so, time uh, until the 1980s, I think, right? It was, it was exactly. illegal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there, there were all sorts of rumors about it. Um, and really, the main reason why it was proscribed both by the nationalists and later the communists is because there were so many people who were attached to it particularly people of influence, that they were afraid of another uh, Taiping, Tianguo, yeah. uh, uprising against the government. Mm. Um, that's why um, one of Master Yang's uh, lineage, um, Xue Dian, yeah, Xue Dian, Xue Dian yeah. was, was, was executed. Was right. He was high up in the Iguan Dao. Yeah, they, he disappeared. Um, yeah. Were, were there many other people from America studying in, in that school at the time that you were there, or were you? No, the only... no it was me. Yeah. It was me, and yeah. I later brought a couple of other people in. Um, Michael Goon, who later went on to study with, uh, um, what's his name, uh, an, a, a Yin family uh, teacher, um, and uh, a couple of other people who really didn't stay because. By the time I brought a couple of Westerners in there, um, I had been there for a long time. Um, there was already this idea that if you were learning martial arts, you know, it was supposed to be some sort of mystical content mm -hmm. to it. And nobody was really prepared for it being as tough as strongman weightlifting. Right. And, you know, the sparring was, you know, you wrap a cloth around your hand, go at it. Uh, on a concrete floor yeah. so you know <laughs> it, it was definitely not what people were expecting when they, when they came to Taiwan in, in search of you know enlightenment and martial arts right so um, you, that's something that, that I've, I've seen you talk about on forums and things like that is about is about conditioning about the, the importance of the initial condition what, what was the, what was that like what, what was your process as a student when you began with them did they put you through just basic conditioning exercises before they even started to teach you the slightest thing or uh, well for example with Henry the very first thing I learned was um, what today would be considered a northern horse stance which mm -hmm. is a si ping ma, which is your feet are on the outside of your shoulders and your thighs are parallel to the ground and you hold that until you fall down. Right. Um, and the same thing in Master Zhang's studio. Um, his ma bu is a little bit wider and a little bit higher, but same thing. And you learned all these associated strength exercises before, I mean, with, with Master Zhang, it, it wasn't until three months into it that I started really learning Xing Yi. The first three months, we're learning how to learn. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the very first thing that he taught me was something very similar to Tan Pui, which was called um, Ba Shou. Um, and it was essentially Xing Yi's version of Tan Pui. And I have seen in mainland China, other schools start students with kind of a Xing Yi flavored Tan Pui. Mm. To build the lower body strength. <clears throat> Yeah, as well as lifting weights and doing arm conditioning and, you know, things that make your body prepared for being able to do this stuff correctly. You know, if you if you go into one of the things I wrote about um, on uh, Empty Flower a long time ago was my first encounter with what I recognized in retrospect was Tai Chi. And it was something that I saw in Chinatown, New York. About in 1960 or 61, um, I was with my mom, who was a friend of um, a uh, restaurateur, uh, Esther Eng, a wonderful woman. Um, and while they were chatting and doing whatever the heck they were doing, I was kind of wandering up and down this Mott Street. And um, I saw an open door and I just stood there. And again, I'm at this point, I'm about seven years old. And uh, 
looking in this jar and I'm seeing people moving in slow motion, dripping sweat like yeah. bullets. And they were doing this with tremendous tension. Okay, so in retrospect, I now realize what I was seeing was, was Tai Chi. Nobody does Tai Chi like that anymore. Yeah, it's true. So, you know, the, the levels of training have changed. Yeah, I definitely think that it's it's become almost a um, uh, not not just a trend, but the norm now that people that seek out uh, internal martial arts are they're looking for something that doesn't require effort, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's actually why I closed my school and became an inner door school, a closed door school. Um, I had a very big school from 1989 until um, until 1994. Um, I had about 200 students. It was called uh, the Shaolin Kung Fu Center. And I closed it down and went to a smaller space um, and basically fired most of my students. The only ones I kept were the ones who want, were willing to do the, the hard work. And from that point on, the school was called Iron Buddha Kung Fu. It was by invitation or referral only. Mm. And I explained to students that, you know, when you come in here, this is like working in a weightlifting gym. You're expected to do the work. And the students who stayed were great. I mean, it was very satisfying, much more gratifying for me to be teaching those students. Yeah, I imagine so. It's it's uh, to the point now where it's not just very difficult to find a, a good teacher. It's even more difficult to find a good student. I think people just don't understand oh, the yeah. dedication that's required. You know, it's a full-time yeah. job in a lot of ways. Yeah, and there's been way too much brainwashing about, you know, Oh, you know, there's a big difference between internal and external kung fu. Just horseshit. Some of the best internal skills I've seen have been from Hungar teachers and Shaolin teachers, and very little of what I've seen um, of high-level martial arts has been from so-called internal teachers. Um, and those those who have it are the ones who have gone through all of this work. Right. It's a false dichotomy in a lot of ways, and there's no shortcut. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's really become a kind of a, um, I hate to use the word meme, but like you said, brainwashing. It's just something that's everyone yeah. bought into for a good, you know, 50 years now, you know. That, that that's they, right. Yeah. And we can thank Robert Smith for that. <laughs> yeah, Robert Smith. And, uh, well, I don't want to speak ill of anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind speaking ill. So, <laughs> um, so you were in Taiwan yeah, about 10 years? Uh, actually, I was there on. I was there full time for about ten years, and then on and off for another four years. Yeah, four years. So I went to. I redid high school there, and I did medical school there, and uh, actually did my first two and a half years of medical practice in a hospital there. Um, so I was completely acculturated when I came to the states in 1980, um, and wasn't able to get a medical license. And also had a lot of culture shock. I and mean, America yeah. was by then a foreign culture to me. Right. Where where did you come back to when you came back to the States? New York City. New York City. Okay. And yeah. and did you immediately start teaching or was that something that came later? No, that's something that came later. Um, I immediately started looking for a job. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, also I, I redid uh, some of my college. I got a, a bachelor's degree here with the intention of going back to medical school. Because um, in Taiwan, just as in Europe, medical school is um, post high school. It's not post baccalaureate. Right. So uh, I went I went to Queens College for a year and a half and got a bachelor's degree. Um, and I was all set to move back to Taiwan because I was pretty disgusted with the scene here. Um, but I was engaged and the woman who I was engaged with didn't want to go to uh, back to Taiwan. So I got married and yeah. stayed in New York. <clears throat> what prompted you to teach? Um, well, I, w I went to work in the intelligence agencies in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, before I went full time, I was working part time as a, um, a contractor doing some undercover work. 
And at the same time, I was still learning from Henry because I was back in New York and Henry's skills were phenomenal. Um, and, uh, you know, people who I worked with were asking me to, you know, they saw some of the stuff I did and they asked me to teach. And then when I moved down to Maryland, um, I started teaching in the agencies um, and developed a bit of a following. And it, it was partly, um, you know, to keep myself active because it's right. real easy to um, say, oh, okay, I know this and not work. And the other thing is you really gain an understanding of what you're doing when you have to teach it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, I mean, that, that to me, um, in fact, I can thank uh, Michael Allen Brown for really getting me into teaching. He had a big following in one of the agencies. His teacher had studied briefly with, with John Jun Fung. And when Mike found out that I was a student of John Gilman, he said, look, I've got a school here. You want to start teaching? So I taught there and I taught in the agencies and I taught at a school in Baltimore, Goes Kung Fu, um, uh, because some of his students had been asking about Xing Yi and blah, blah. So I actually started them on, on Foundation Shaolin, started mm. teaching the stuff. Um, and that's how I got to teach full time. When I left the agencies in 1989, that's what I was doing for a full time job for. Did any of your students from when you were teaching for the intelligence agencies uh, follow you when you went into a uh, sort of civilian private? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 In fact, I, I taught a fair amount of law enforcement people. Oh, yeah. Um, and what I was teaching them was what my teacher taught to the secret police, which was, you know, stuff that was taken out of the systems and drilled repetitively um, for practical usage. Right. Was it stuff that, um, were, were the techniques things that you had to modify very much for practical usage or were they pretty much already practical to begin with? Mm, I would say the stick work didn't need much modification. Um, some of the uh, techniques needed to be modified for two reasons. Some of them were based on assumptions that I didn't think were very real. Mm. Um, I mean, anytime you were, you know, somebody is teaching, you know, what do you do if somebody grabs your collar? Nobody grabs your collar. Right. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but the other thing is that, oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing is that um, some of the techniques, the end point is break a neck or break right. a limb or dislocate a limb. And if you're teaching police, they can't do that. Right. So it needs to be modified. Um, if you're teaching in the intelligence agencies, uh, it doesn't need to be modified. Different story, yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes I've, I've, uh, people say that when you teach uh, soldiers or police officers, a lot of times you have to sort of take a much smaller number of techniques and just have like a lot of repetitive drilling. You know, you don't want to really... That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. Um, the other thing that needed a lot of modification were knife techniques. Hmm. Defenses against knives and learning how to use knives. Um like I said, in the intelligence agencies, some of the things I could teach straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, with police, um, I mean, first of all, a policeman is not going to defend himself against the knife barehanded if he has his gun, right. which is sensible. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't have a gun, um, then there are things you can teach, but you can't follow it up with, then you plant the knife in the yeah. opponent. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, you mentioned that you had a public school for, you said from 1989 to 94? Yeah, till 94. And then from 96 to 2007-ish, 2006, 2007, it was a closed door school. And I found the closed door school worked a lot better. When your your students that come to your closed door school, typically how much experience do they already have? You said they're either by invitation or referral. Um, I would say it was half and half, about half of them were just, you know, have had always been interested, but had never done martial arts. And the other half were very experienced martial arts. And there was also a cadre of people I was teaching who were already teachers out there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention names because right. some of them are still out there. 
Um, but uh, there were teachers who said, gee, this is stuff I wanted to learn, or gee, this is stuff I've been missing. Um, and I wound up teaching teachers, which um, is actually quite gratifying because they tend to, if somebody gets to the point where they realize that they are missing something, they're really easy to teach. Yeah. And they're usually very motivated. Yeah. No resistance there. I right. With, as far as the new students, the inexperienced students that you had, did you start them off with a foundation of Shaolin uh, type Absolutely. movies? Yeah. Absolutely. I learned one of the teachers I studied with in Taiwan was um, a very superannuated monk by the name of um, uh, Hong Yue. He was an abbot. And his story is way more interesting than mine. He um, came from a military family. Um, he wound up being very, very high up in the Chinese army. And he was one of the advisors to the Empress Dowager. Wow. And um, he got very disgusted with her. And he was obviously a very talented martial artist because that's how you got to be a high-ranking military official. And in fact, he is the guy who took a pot shot at Li Hongzhang and wounded Li Hongzhang uh, during the Boxer Rebellion. Wow. And of course, unfortunately, he was actually trying to kill the Empress Dowager. He wound up injuring Li Hongzhang's arm and he fled. And where did he take refuge? He took refuge in the Shaolin Temple. Wow. And this is, um, this is what, when was the uprising? 1890? So the temple was still functioning then. So whatever skills he had were increased, and he learned um, the Lohan system, the real Lohan system, um, which was a system practiced in the northern courtyard of the temple, and it was strictly for people who were really the, the military of the temple. Um, and that's what fighting monks were. I mean, there was even a dichotomy within the temples. You had the fighting monks who were looked down upon by the contemplative monks. Right. Um, so the Lohan system that he learned was phenomenal stuff, and he taught me a fair amount. Um, and that's what I teach to my students as a Shaolin foundation, and it is very consistent. And I should say this is true of all Chinese martial arts. The mechanics are consistent across the board. So if you're learning real Shaolin as opposed to picking opera stuff, mm -hmm. um, you're learning the identical mechanics that you're going to be learning in Shenyi or Bagua or Hongar. Um, the difference is the mix and proportion, but the the mechanics of the hips and the shoulders and the spine and all that it's identical. Um, so again, any dichotomy that's there is really either a misunderstanding or or incomplete teaching. Interesting. So you know, I know that you know when we say that Shaolin, you know, in the United States. And, you know, probably Europe, too. You say that word and, you know, there's a lot of Shaolin schools or schools that, uh, you know, Shaolin. You know, people, use it, people use it like the way we use, um, you know, if you're drinking a soft drink, you say, oh, I'll have a Coke. And Coke, right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, all, most most Shaolin schools in the United States or a lot of them anyway, have a have a Lohan, you know, component, something that they call Lohan. Right. Um, and it's usually nothing to do with real law. Yeah. What, um, is there any way that you could describe what differentiates the the actual Shaolin Lohan from those from what you've seen in the U.S. as being taught as Lohan? Yeah. Well, what you've got here, like you said, are Lohan sets. It's just a name slapped on a set. You right. Know, um, the Lohan system is a system that I would say the closest way to look at this, the Lohan system mechanics is to look at somebody who's really, really good at either Hongar or Taiwan White Crane and okay. look at the way that they do their horse stance and their bow stance. And what you'll see is tremendous opening and closing abilities in all the joints, um, twisting and coiling, but not the way that the Chen stylists you see today do. It's much more subtle. Um, tremendous control over the small muscle groups in their back and abdomen and the ability to generate force using the entire frame um, in a sequential fashion. Um, the real Lohan system is not flashy at all. It's very, very bread and butter looking. Um, and uh, 
actually the remnants of Shah of Lohan system are present in a currently taught system in China called the Gu family Shaolin. Um, and really it's stuff that was taught directly from the Shaolin temple. And one of the monks simply returned to civilian life and began teaching. Um, the flavor of it is it, it looks soft unless you touch the person and you realize the person is really using a lot of strength or they're generating a lot of strength. There is um, a certain elasticity to it um, and explosiveness to it. And um, without actually being able to demonstrate or see it, it's, it's hard to go any further than that. But it's not the sort of stuff that you see, you know, demonstrated in most schools. Um, some old praying mantis, Mei Hua Tanglang, has elements of Lahan in it. Mm. And the Lahan system kind of has the flavor that you would see in older Mei Hua Tanglang, which is the original Tanglang system. Interesting. So you, your new students, they, they stay with this generally about how long? I know it depends on about the individual practitioner, but. About a year. A year. I, I, requ I require them to have, it's not really a time-based thing. I require them to be able to achieve certain things mechanically before they can go on and do Xing Yi. Right. And one of the problems with teaching Xing Yi and Bagua is that if you don't have these mechanics, you're not going to get them by doing the forms. You know, you may get them by doing what I learned, which is, foundation skills mm. um so you know if somebody doesn't want to learn the lahan system you know i may start them on foundation skills um but they're eventually going to learn the lahan stuff anyway uh, but it, it's really a matter of, le of learning how to control the major muscle groups and open and close the joints and have stability and plantedness in stances um, and, and then you can go on and, and apply it in different systems. I mean, once you've learned all these mechanics, once you've learned all, all these fundamentals, it, it doesn't matter what system you learn. Right. It's like once you understand the principles of an internal combustion engine, yeah. um, you know, the difference is going to be, are you driving a Kia or a Mercedes? Right. So you said um, in an article that I read once that uh, you felt that for practical purposes that uh, Xingyi Pakwa and Tai Chi were basically on the verge of extinction. I'm not sure. Yes. I'm not sure when you wrote that article, but it was a while back, I think. And um, uh, what would you say uh, about today, the state of those arts today? Do you think it's even worse than it was when you wrote that? Or do you think there's some improvement being made in some area? I'd say it, dep it depends on where you look. I mean, like you said, Master Yang is teaching really really good stuff yeah some of his students are really getting it um and it's not a, a matter of whether or not he's teaching it. a lot of it has to do with students being able to think and work on stuff and apprehend what they're being taught mm -hmm. and that's true whether you're teaching martial arts or teaching calculus which i failed twice um uh as far as in mainland China, again, it depends on where you look. I would say as far as across the board, I'd say the, system, the um, situation is pretty dismal. Mm. If you're looking in closed door schools, which still exist in China, then there is some very, very good stuff still being taught. In Taiwan, the situation is pretty uh, dire. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I saw that happening back in the early 80s. I mean, as soon as computers and computer games came in, that replaced recreationally what people were doing in martial arts. And when I said in Taiwan, martial arts were like baseball, right? it really was. It was like, you know, when I was a kid, you'd play sandlot baseball. That's what you should pass the time. In Taiwan, you played, you did martial arts. Right. Um, and so the only people who were doing real martial arts in Taiwan are the Hakka people who still have a really good tradition of it. Right. Um, and the people who are in criminal organizations, they're mostly doing either white crane or wuzu, 
Hmm. Um, and there are actually the the uh, students of the dragon teacher who I mentioned are also still pretty good. Um, but it's it's really disappearing in Taiwan. Again, it's become what you know people do in the morning and you know what little old ladies and little old men do to amuse themselves, right. which is really unfortunate. Yeah, I agree. Um, I I feel like in the United States, something that I'm I'm seeing myself is that the people who are seeking out internal martial arts are people that are um, my age, older people who did um, you know. Um, I'm, I'm using the terms internal and external. I know they're not exactly great terms, right. you know, people, people like myself that you know, I started doing Shaolin when I was younger and, you know, things like that did Wing Chun for a while. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of people who are interested in Xingyi, Bagua and Tai Chi are people who are, are middle-aged, you know, and, and a right. lot of, a lot of them have no martial arts experience. And, and, right. And, yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's difficult for them to comprehend what they need to do in order to make it a real experience. Um, and it's, and it's even, you know, it's difficult to find a, someone to teach them if they, if they yeah. do need it, the sacrifice they have to take. Yeah. And there are plenty of people who are willing to take their money and teaching them. Oh yes. Chinese, Chinese flavored cultural dance. Yeah, absolutely. Martial arts flavored cultural dance. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. A good comparison would be, I don't know how old you are. You're 50 something. <laughs> I'm in my late forties. Yeah. Close enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm almost 70. Yeah. Right? Wow. So, um, a good comparison for my age would be to look at the great karateka who came to America after having served in say, uh, Okinawa or the Philippines and these people who came to America who learned karate the old-fashioned way, you know, were a lot of them were really phenomenal martial artists. You look at them and you look at, you know, what's being taught as karate now. Yeah. And it's it's horrifying. Yeah. Uh, one of my friends from the military had learned Ishin Ru from the family that preserved Ishin Ru. And, yeah. and the guy was hard as nails, and you didn't want to look cross-eyed in his direction. Um, I don't see anybody with that kind of skill in America anymore. It, yeah. it, it, it's, it's disappeared. Kar karate has become what your kids do after school. And yeah. in fact, when I was in Toronto, I tried to um, teach martial arts. I was at University of Toronto Medical uh, School for a year and a half doing some graduate work and I tried to teach in Toronto and um, a teacher who taught a lot of kids said, Oh, why don't you come to my school and help me teach the children's program? And I said, well, what I'm teaching is really not appropriate for children. Right. And he flipped out on me. And I was like, you don't want to be teaching seven and eight year olds how to break arms and break necks. <laughs> right. yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people people don't understand it. Even uh, unfortunately, when you even say the word karate now, that's what people automatically think is a is a school in a strip mall somewhere where they can dump their kids after school. And exactly. you know, it, it's a shame. And and most people, yeah. you know, at least where I live, don't even know what Shingi and Bagua are. And and right. if you mention Tai Chi, they they you know think about elderly people, you know, in, in, uh, right. in the park. Yeah. So that, that leads me to my next question is something that I've been asking a lot of the teachers that I've been interviewing. What do you think the, the future of these arts is, uh, particularly in the West? Well, the future of the arts is already here. Okay? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. twofold. It's, you know, bullshit martial arts being taught in script malls. Yeah. And it's the original stuff returning to closed door teaching. So if you're in Chinatown, New York, I mean, you still have friends teaching in Chinatown, New York. They are still teaching closed door schools almost exclusively to Chinese. Um, and they are teaching the old way and they are teaching good stuff. Um, so we're back to the same dichotomy, only worse mm -hmm. because the, um, you know, the genuine article has been driven out by the, the dross, yeah. by the, the chaff. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a good cover for the real stuff. Yeah. 
means that if you've got somebody who is sincere and really wants to learn this stuff, they don't even know that there's a difference, you know, unless they're exposed to it. Sometimes not even then. I've, I've found that a lot of times with um, people who are well-intentioned and willing to do the work, if you, no matter how politely point out to them that what they're doing might not be the genuine article, not only do they get angry, but they make a conscious or subconscious choice that they would rather continue living the, the fantasy right. that they've been indulging in because the, the reality of it is, is too hard to accept. Yeah, well, that, it's the saying that it, Mark Twain said. You know, it is easier to fool somebody than to convince somebody that they have been fooled. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. Very true. I mean, my good friend and teacher, YC Wong, is one of the last great teachers of Hungar, of really Lamjo lineage of Hungar. Um, he's in his 90s now. His son is extremely talented. Um, and YC produced some really, really good students. Um, I myself, at my age now, would actually like to start learning Hungar. There's nobody to learn from. Yeah. You know, unless I was to move to San Francisco, I'm screwed. And there used to actually be good Hungar teachers here in the D.C. area. They're gone. There's not not even behind closed doors. That's a tragedy. That's a yeah. something nobody wants to see happen. Um, but I I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know if there is an answer to that. Well, the answer is to keep teaching behind closed doors, keep teaching quality product, um, and hopefully finding good students. I mean, in Hong Kong, there are still some very, very good martial arts being taught behind closed doors. In the Chinatowns in the UK and in Singapore, um, there are still very, very good martial arts being taught behind closed doors. Um, San Francisco, there's still some very good stuff. Again, behind closed doors. The stuff that's out in public is, you know, for entertainment purposes only. Right. So have you ever thought about producing something along the lines of um, a book or, or tutorial DVDs or anything of that nature? Yeah, actually, for a while, I was working on a series of books and DVDs, um, partly because I'm still practicing. It's very hard for me to find the time practicing medicine still very hard for me to find the time. But also, um, I kept running into people who claimed that they were, had learned from me. Mm. I, I, the more I published stuff, the more I had people either claiming that they had learned from me or taking this material and claiming it, claiming it as their own, mm. which now doesn't bother me as much as it did then. But I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, a well-known teacher who is now claiming to teach to uh, treat cancer with Qigong, hmm. um, who is mostly self-taught, came to study from me um, and made numerous trips and brought me out to his school in California uh, where I taught. And every time I taught, I said, look, this material is proprietary. You know, this written these written materials are proprietary. Um, I don't mind you teaching them, but I mind you teaching them incorrectly. Right. You know, so you teach them as they are taught to you. And in fact, ask me if I think that you are ready to teach it. And any of the written materials are absolutely proprietary. They cannot be published without my permission. And everybody signed off on that, literally. Mm -hmm. Well, this person put out several books mm -hmm. under the title of Master's Manual of whatever. And... Um, Lo and behold, some of the stuff that I taught at the seminars and taught him privately showed up in these books, and I sued him. Yeah. And, you know, I was angry not only because he, you know, did not follow through on the agreement, but also because he himself isn't really that skillful at what I taught him. Yeah. And that is what really bothers me. I mean, the bottom line is it's an it doesn't bother me if somebody learns something from me and teaches it well. Right. It bothers me if somebody learns something from me, misrepresents it, and teaches it poorly. And then what you're doing is contributing to the degradation of the arts. So I'm trying to figure out an answer to that. And the answer is I'll probably just write as much as I can, make some DVDs to whatever degree I can, 
put it out there and drink heavily to deal with the emotional consequences of seeing it taught badly. Yeah, it sounds like a plan. <laughs> I mean, Young High, Master Young is doing a brilliant job with his deal. Yeah. Well, it's incredible what he's doing right now because, uh, you know, he, he, you know, people keep contacting him and saying, you know, teach online, do this, do that, you know, with the DVDs and everything. And he's concentrating more on, you know, the, the, the type of things that he's doing on his YouTube channel. And it's so much information. I mean, it's almost impossible to, uh, right. to absorb it all. I mean, he's already put out so much information. I mean, maybe you could do something along those lines. That's actually what I'm looking at doing as I slow my medical practice down. The other thing is he actually had, I don't know. I think it was two dozen or so episodes that were in Chinese. And yeah. in Chinese, I mean, the, the information was just phenomenal. Um, I, I, I hope he continues to do that stuff. Yeah. And that it's gratifying to me to have somebody like him doing that stuff because he is far more qualified than I am. And he also has a knack for teaching, which is great. He does. Yeah. yeah. He knows a lot. And it would it would be great to see some do something like that because I know that you know a lot you know and it it would be great well, for you. people to be able to access that yeah. You know. So is there anything that you're doing right now that you'd like to talk about, like to promote? Um, or are you just still teaching closed door? Um, I am still teaching closed door. I I teach basically the same way that I taught before. I no longer teach the Buddha Hand Wing Chun um, for various reasons. Um, mostly because uh, I don't like what it does to people um, psychologically and emotionally. Um, and that's one of the components of Chinese martial arts that we don't talk about much, which is that certain systems actually make you a very violent person. Uh, agreed. They're intended to. Um, and I, I stopped teaching the Buddha handling Chun for that reason. Um, I still teach the Lohan system and the Xing Yi and the Bagua, uh, but I'm also very much teaching strongman strength building because when I was very young, I learned from a guy by the name of Joe Bonomo. Um, I don't know, you're probably still too young to have ever heard of Bonomo, Tur Turkish I, I, I think I know that name. I'm actually, uh, I don't lift weights as much anymore as I used to, but I, I was really interested in reading about people like, uh, you know, Maxic. I don't know if you know who that was, sure. um, you know, yeah. and the old strongmen, um, Arthur Saxon and people like that. So I, I think I've heard that name before. Yeah. Well, Joe Bonomo was, mm -hmm. was a brilliant, brilliant strength lifter. Um, and he lived on and off in New York. And he actually lived in Los Angeles, but he first lived in New York and he was in New York a lot. So I, when I was very young, I managed to learn from him how to lift properly. Um, and I also had some peripheral contact with uh, Joe uh, Greenstein. I don't know if you ever heard of the Mighty Adam. Mighty Adam, yeah. He used to hold yeah. an airplane by his beard, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, he and his son lived in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so I was, in my preteen years, in early teen years, I was actually a stage magician. And the he had friends in the stage magic community so i would because you know he was a, a carnival performer right so um i i got to meet him and i didn't learn from him but i was inspired by him like, you know seeing him do these things and you know asking him how do you do this and you know he would explain how to do this and that's what got me started on strong memory i've been strong memory lifting my whole life wow. so here i am close to 70 and i can still lift a patient over my head um incredible and well what I have discovered, or at least what I've discovered for myself, is that you need to learn, you need to practice strength your entire life, or it goes away. Yeah. And that has to be an integral part of your martial arts. You can't just assume that because you've done all the foundation work that you stop doing it. Right. It has to continue going. So I still do the absolute basic stuff that I learned you know, 60 years ago to keep me strong and flexible. Um, so I, I concentrate on that a lot too. And I, I enjoy teaching that a lot. It's great seeing somebody, you know, who can barely lift a bag of groceries come back a few months later and, you know, they can do squats and deadlifts with significant weight. And 
get some control over their muscles and joints. So yeah. that's really where I'm at now. It's a game changer for people's health. And it's great too, because um, you, you know, even senior citizens can begin to, uh, you know, yes. start lifting weights and, and see a marked and put market improvement in their, in their lives quickly within six yes. months. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. It would be good to see you do something with that too. You know, if, if nothing else, you know, I understand your concerns about people, you know, um, misrepresenting themselves using your, your martial arts teachings, but I might, I think, uh, I think an autobiography would be a, would be an interesting <laughs> too because you've worn many hats in your life, you know, uh, things like this, something like that would be hard to put down. Yeah. I, I am working on a memoir. Um, the only problem is that when people read it, they, they're not sure if it's fiction or not. <laughs> right. Those are the best kind. That's how you know it's real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some, sometimes some stories you, you don't even bother telling people because you know they're they're just going to think that you made them up. You know, and they're they're one hundred percent true. Yeah, yeah. If you've lived a good life, or 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 an interesting life. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. One of the two. It's the old thing, of, you know. Good. You know the the um, anecdote about Mae West going to a uh, soiree wearing a diamond necklace and somebody remarked goodness what diamonds and she said goodness had nothing to do with them she said what i'm sorry i didn't catch goodness had nothing to do with them oh yeah right right interesting well dr fish i really appreciate you taking time out to talk to me today uh maybe we can get back to do it again sometime can you stick around for a minute yeah sure Okay. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Take care.